a little out of position here. Uh, later on tonight, you'll see me in my natural habitat. I'll be on the stage for the Yoma section of the CSO where I've been for the last 35 years. But um, it's, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk about this wonderful program. Uh, for one thing, we are playing what I believe is the, my single favorite movement in the entire symphonic repertoire, the last movement of the Arroyo Symphony. And I seem to be the only one who thinks that. Uh, it doesn't get the love I think it deserves. And so I'm going to talk about it in a little bit of detail. And regrettably, we only have a half hour, so I apologize in advance. Some of the other incredible music on this program is going to get kind of a whirlwind tour. Uh, but um, I assume that the um, future composer tonight um, is of some familiarity to many of us. Um, <laughs> uh, they may come with not show some flat around here. Uh, but you might not uh, be familiar with the first piece on the program, the Consecration of the House Overture. As I said, I've been there for 35 years. I believe this is the first time I've ever played this piece. And it's been wonderful to get to know the rehearsals. And I have to say, I fell in love with it right from the first notes. And, and let me explain a little bit about that. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of the history, because you can open up your programs. We have an incredible program annotator, uh, Phil Pusher, who covers the history way better than I can. But, but suffice to say, Beethoven wrote the Consecration of the House Overture to uh, commemorate the um, complete renovation and reopening of an important concert hall in Vienna. And when I play this piece, I'm reminded that Beethoven started his career doing what I do. He was playing viola in his hometown Bond Orchestra as a teenager, supporting his family. And he totally gets it from our point of view. Because when an orchestra gets on the stage of a new hall or a hall that's completely renovated, the first thing we're thinking is what are the acoustics like in here? How hard am I going to have to work to sign in this place? And the beginning of this piece is he devised it. It's a perfectly constructed acoustical test of the hall. It starts out with these short, loud, vibrant chords, and then silence. So how many of you can say, what's the, what's the reverberation like? What's the, is there an echo in the of the How resonant is it? And let me just play the very beginning. This is going to be. Line drawing 
Brian Jules, brilliant characters in the New Yorker. How do we simple? How do we effective? Uh, you might know that as Beethoven's death has overtook him, um, he, uh, more and more he resorted to writing down his conversations so he could converse with people. And there were these notebooks, and one of his companions at the time, a guy named Schindler, um, has had in his possession a notebook in which there was this fantastic exchange that he had with Beethoven on the subject of Rossini. And Beethoven said, in Beethoven's words, not mine, and it's pretty much for Beethoven, he said, you know, Rossini's big problem is that when he was a young composition student, his teachers did not kick him in the ass really often enough. <laughs> a fascinating insight into the time and theories of uh, pedagogy. But, um, but you can understand Beethoven's resentment. Um, Rossini, he was, he was out there. So he was incredible kind of success. He was a sensation in a way that Beethoven never achieved in his whole lifetime. And it came so easily for Rossini. He uh, was creating about three hours a year. Beethoven spent decades fussing over his one opera. Um, Fidelio, and it's not clear that he ever really got it in the shape that really satisfied him. That's part of it. But there's another part, too. When Beethoven was asked who his favorite composer was, more often than not, he would mention George Frederick Kennedy, who was at the peak of his career a hundred years before he was over to the Great Britain. And I thought it might be um, of some interest to play a little piece of the Handel Overture to uh, the water music. And what I want you to notice here is that whereas the Rossini is just a single line, heavy drawing, the handle is this very complex, rich tapestry. There's several lines of melody, all going on at the same time, conversing with each other, imitating each other, um, in dialogue. And let's just take a little bit of this, you know what I mean? Tension from getting out of the key 
and then release and hold this thing back. This is what makes this music work at its greatest and what gives us this feeling of fulfillment that we get from great artists. Um, okay, so we got Beethoven's first symphony, symphony number one in C major. Um, forgive me a really terrible analogy, but you might think of C major as the girl, like in romantic comedies, you know, um, boy meets C major, boy loses C major, boy gets C major. <laughs> yes, yeah, um, okay, so the piece of God begin with meeting C major, but instead of Beethoven doing what you ordinarily expect, um, you know, here's C major, C major, please meet you, C, C major. The first two chords of the slow introduction of the first moment of Beethoven's first symphony are these. We're here. And this is an act. We're not going to say we're not. He met the wrong girl. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole slow introduction, instead of establishing C major, little by little we discover it. It never quite lands on ambiguous to hear here at home until the slow introduction of the first movement is over and we get to the fast part. And then In Beethoven's culture, in his time and place. 
The first one probably covered a little bit. It's this gargantuan, massive structure. You know, it's like the, the hero just takes up more space than the rest of us. And his struggles are more intense than the rest of us. There's these moments in the piece where the harmonies just clash. And the climax of the piece, from midway through the first movement, there is this chord, and I can't analyze it. I don't know what it is. But he hammers this home several times. Here it is. It's The third movement, like the third movement of the first symphony, is a scare zone. It's a fast dance. And here, I think, what we're seeing is you know, this very typical thing in our culture, in our mythology, of the hero as this incredible athlete, able to do these physical feats that the rest of us can. I mean, it goes all the way back to Western civilization, right? You know, King Arthur pulls his sword out of the rock and doesn't bail a wolf, like, tear Grendel's arm off or something, a very, very impressive feat. And when I was a kid, did you get this, that George Washington supposedly threw a silver dollar across the Potomac? You know, so, so the hero as um, this incredible athlete doing these incredible physical feats. And sure enough, the, um, the, the third woman is this fast, intricate dance. But what's really interesting about it, and we don't take on it, is that it's at a whistler. The tempo mark, the, I'm sorry, the dynamic marking is pianistical, very, very soft. So the hero is under such incredible control that he can do all these new kinetic dance steps and never breaks uh, sweat, it never goes above a whisper. It's as if, you know, suppose my bowl weighed 40 or 50 pounds, and when I lifted it, instead of going, I could just go. I think that's the take on athleticism who can use the first time you have show this character being so soft. And there's this latent power there, there's this tension. And then when the moment comes, and the music just explodes, and in one second we've gone from the softest end to the loudest. You know, that's another aspect of physical balance. And, uh, oh, great, I have time to talk about the last one. I love the last one. Okay, so um, to go back to my terrible um, boy meets girl metaphor, the, the third symphony is in E flat major. And we've established that very nicely in the, um, in the few harrowing trials of the first movie, and the church so ends. And now, you know, it's the last one, maybe there's going to be like some different take breaks. You know, the hero has a, you know, a triumphant, uh, whatever. But the beginning of it is very strange. It starts, the first nine notes are this. And these notes seem to point us into completely the wrong key. And you hear, it wants to go to the G minor. Wrong note. And, um, you know, I'm reminded of, um, Chekhov's admonition to um, playwrights, um, where he said, 
if you drag a gun on the stage, you know this? If you drag a gun on the stage in the first scene, you damn well better shoot it off before the play's over. <laughs> so, this, this, this is this is the four sons. But for now, we got the book. That's the note. Keep cascading down and put us in the right place. Oh, what's also 
interesting is he ties the whole thing together in this very classical way because our, our, our um, embarrassing relative in the basement is still there. Thank you very much. Please enjoy the time.